The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Today we have uh, uh, a great writer, a writer that uh, everyone knows his name. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, his last book. We're going to talk about his whole career. So uh, welcome to the show, Lev Raphael. It's great to be talking to you, and I hope things are uh, the weather's good in Seattle. You know, it's been, it's been sunny and rainy, sort of mixed. Um, well, that's good because you need the rain, and, and it's been sunny and rainy here, so, I'm, so we have the same weather. Yeah, no complaints. No complaints. Nope. And, um, nope. Well, here we are. So, um, you, you've got quite the uh, writing history. Um, so, you, you always wanted to be a writer. You're one of those guys that, since you can remember, probably, you've been a writer. Yeah, second grade. Second grade. I was in love with storytelling in second grade. I was read to uh, by my mother. I loved story time in, uh, in school and at the library. And I also was a very early reader. I read above my uh, my grade, and I think um, in second grade I started reading *I Robot*. Oh. I didn't understand all of it, but I started reading it because <laughs> my brother was a science fiction fan. So, he, and he was five years older than me, so he was bringing. Uh, uh, so he brought all these books back from the library, and I would just look at his books, and um, I just I fell in love with. Uh, a narrative of all kinds, uh, but mostly science fiction when I was young, and also adventure stories like The Three Musketeers. And I just, that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do with my life. That and teach, because uh, I came from a family of teachers. And so, and, and I got, I've gotten to do both those things. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be one of those people on this deathbed who said, oh, you know, if only I'd done X, Y, or Z. I've done it. I've done what I wanted to do. I don't, I didn't. I, I haven't had an unlived life. Well, that's a good thing. That's a real good thing to be able to say. Um, do, do, now, do you do you have a favorite type of of writing, as in uh, genre, genre, or do you have sort of a um, all around, like as in reading and writing yourself? Well, it's to, to, reading and writing are different. I've published in uh, about a dozen different genres, everything from memoir to literary fiction to mystery to a vampire novel, a uh, novella to uh, psychology. And mostly now I read um, history and biography, uh, but the, with a pro, uh, proviso. I mean, I... Have, the writing has to be really, really good. The writing has to be the quality of a novel, and the, and the storytelling has to be as good as a novel. So I have to feel totally captured by the voice of the biographer or the historian, whoever she or he or they are, uh, and is and the um, and I just need to be pulled in by the narrative. So those so. Um, because I'm always stimulated by really good writing of whatever genre. Uh, I used to read more fiction, uh, I think, um, than I do now. I haven't found that many contemporary writers that I enjoy reading as much as older writers. Um, so, but there's just so much good writing of all kinds out there, and and people are always recommending books to me, and that that I or that I just stumble on. Uh, and I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised, and I'm always learning. Um, two, of the, two of the writers that I've gotten to know in the, uh, 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 in the last few years that I hadn't known of before, Bernard Cornwell, who has that amazing uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon series um, that has been turned into a TV uh, series, The Last Kingdom, and C.S. Harris, who writes Regency Mysteries, and... Both of them are really uh, superb at writing, uh, at creating a scene and, and taking you into it uh, in terms of all the sense details. And I tend to be really visual, so I'm drawn to writers who appeal to more than the visual, and they do that. Uh, I, I've also fallen in love with Martin Cruz Smith and his Arcadi Ranko series, and I've read all the books twice. Uh, and I'll probably read them a third time because 
I, I love the cynicism of his uh, Soviet cop and 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 the take on uh, the Soviet Union as it collapses and becomes this uh, ol- uh, oligarchy and giant crime syndicate. But they're all really, all three of them are really fine writers. And um, what do you consider good writing? But what, what is it? Is it the story? Is it the wordsmith? Uh, what, what part of the book or novel is the the thing that captures you? It's it's all of it. It's both of it. I mean, I can't. There's certain people who I can't read because my the the prose is just too bland it's not that i i i like ornate or baroque prose it's that the writing just has to be evocative of whatever of whatever the scene is and 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 that could be any kind of style in any kind of voice in any kind of person third person first person second person direct address you know whatever it doesn't matter um the and and the writing carries the story. I mean, I, there's, there. If uh, I know there are people who who say, well, I don't care about the writing as long as it's got a good plot, and you know that's fine. That plot isn't enough for me, uh, and so I so I admire uh, mystery. Uh, for instance, crime writers who who both write beautifully and also tell tell a great story. I mean, Walter Mosley. Is one of them. I mean, he's. I think he's amazing in book after book after book. Laurie Rader Day. I think she's is fantastic. I can, you know, I just the love diving into her work. Uh, Ken Follett. I mean, he's somebody I fell in love with a long time ago. And then someone completely different. Janet Ivanovich's early books were, were hilarious. I loved the. I loved the writing. I loved the voice. And I love the storytelling. So for me, the two are interlocked. And when I, uh, I used to review very heavily for the Detroit Free Press and the Washington Post and a couple of other newspapers, and, and then also for radio stations. And I also had my own radio show. And I couldn't do a book, uh, uh, talk about a book, unless it appealed to me at all the at both those levels: the level of the story and the level of the writing. And 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 that's subjective because people, will, you know, I'll. Um, I'll, I'll point something out and I'll say, I think the, this is really beautifully written, and some say, oh, it's so bland. Or I'll say, I think this is really beautiful, uh, beautifully written, and someone will say, I can't even get through a sentence of it. It's too dense for me. So, you know, that's very subjective. And I was aware of that as a reviewer, that, you know, I was just one opinion. And, and also, you know, one opinion on one day. I mean, there were days that I was in a foul mood and, you know, I might not have reviewed a book as well as I might have on the day when I was in a better mood. You know, that's just, that's the luck of the draw. That's another thing that's really hard for writers to deal with is that, you know, reviews are, are personal opinions and those persons might be having a really bad time and might, or might just read your book at the wrong time in their reviewing cycle. So maybe they've read too many amateur mysteries and then they have to review yours and it's an amateur mystery and they think oh give me a break another one you know what i mean um so so you you have to roll with that so lev in in your own writing how do you balance those different parts because that's all i mean you can only invest so much time and so many words into each element right like how do you balance that in your own work you know i've been i've been I published my first short story in 1978, and I it's become it's really become organic for me. Um, it's hard to it's hard to explain it beyond that. I you know I I did an MFA in creative writing, uh, which helped me not so much from not because of the the professors I worked with, but uh, because I was in basically a giant writer's group for two and a half years. I mean, people who were passionate about poetry and fiction and drama and, you know, read to each other and recommended books. And also we read a lot of, re- we, we had a lot of uh, classwork. Uh, I had 30 credits of, uh, of literature and I read a lot of really amazing novels that I might not have read uh, Otherwise, I don't think I would have read Joseph Conrad, honestly, if I hadn't had him assigned to me. And then a lot of contemporary British writers at the time, uh, um, you know, like Muriel Spark, who was hilarious in a dry English way. And so uh, Anita Bruckner, uh, you know, 
these were um, so I so I had that basic training. I I read voraciously. I mean, my college mentor said, if you want to be a writer, read everything. I said, what do you mean? She said, just read everything. So I kind of tried to read everything. And so for me, the you know, I don't find um, each book has its own voice, right? Uh, my Nick Hoffman mystery series has a specific voice. It's it's the voice of a put upon uh, English professor who watches corrupt and stupid people around him uh, take advantage of others, and you know he he he's not a superhero, but in effect he is fighting for justice in his small way. That's in first person. That's a very specific specific voice. The vampire novel I wrote, the Goth- uh, novella, the, Goth- uh, the Vampire of Gotham, that's written in a um, uh, in a period voice because I studied a lot of, of um, Gilded Age fiction. It's set in New York City in, in, in about 1910, 1915, and it's about a Jewish vampire, and it's also erotic, and the. Um, and so that voice was very different from other books that I've written. Each book just, just I, I find what it has to, what it ha- how it has to be written, both in story and in voice. One of them, unfortunately, took me twenty years, uh, <laughs> and I never want that to happen again. I, it, uh, so that's my novel, um, The German Money, and which got a rave review in the Washington Post. I guess it was worth it. They, they compared me to Philip Roth and and John le Carre and uh, and you know uh, and and Kafka. I mean, what a trio, right? And it blew my mind with the review. Yeah. Like, okay, maybe it was worth twenty years of work to get a review like that. Because when do you when do you get something like that? Uh, but um, each book is different, um, and each book has its challenges. Each book has its joys. Uh, you can't predict. So so the balance. Grows out of the work itself. At least that's how it, that's how I found it. You know, I've I've published on um, published twenty six books now, so it's uh, I've been at it a long time. Do you, Do you think the quality of writing has gone down, or or the quality of uh, of um, grammar, uh, especially in let's say uh, mainstream America? Well, I think. Well, yeah. Okay, so uh, I just I'm 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 a few years away from a six-year stint teaching creative writing and other courses at Michigan State University. So, based on the writing of some of my students or a lot of them, yeah, I'd say that that that's gone down. But you know, there are a lot of complicated uh, reasons for that. I mean, part of it is that. Um, Grammar isn't taught the way it used to be. I mean, that's one thing. But I think also people are read, um, write like what uh, what they read online, and what we read online tends to be a lot of it tends to be pretty informal. And certainly, there are, you know, spell check is is evil because it just doesn't. It, 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 spell checking doesn't catch a lot of things that are wrong, uh, and and also continually suggest things that are wrong, uh, and so and I think people rely on it. I think and I see this all the time, even in the New York Times and the Washington Post. People have clearly not read their own work by themselves. They've run it through spell checking, and it missed a lot of things. It missed you know grammatical errors and spelling errors. You know, hominins like it apostrophe s and its. I mean, you know, the con- the contraction versus the possessive. I'll tell you something. After six years of teaching, it, it kind of messed up my own writing because sometimes I'll be typing an email and I'll look at that and I think that word is spelled wrong because I've been looking at that word spelled wrong for so many years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yes. Yeah, so, in some ways, I think. Generally, yeah, maybe uh, maybe the quality of of general writing has gone down, but I think there's so many there are amazing writers out there. So I think that hasn't that hasn't uh, deteriorated at all. I mean, there are wonderful writers like Val McDermott. I mean, people are producing fantastic crime fiction uh, um, all over the place, you know, in different languages. And I and I think there's some really good translators out there too, because one of the things I like to read works in translation 
and there are people who who do um, you know who do translating, and you read the book and you don't realize it was not written in English. I mean, like Headhunters by Joe Nesbo. Um, I've read that three times. That book is amazing. It does not sound as if it was written in Norwegian. It really doesn't. It you know you don't get that feel that it's been translated and and there's there's some awkwardness there. It just is. It's beautiful. The the writing is just is smooth and fluid and powerful and uh, it's also a great movie. If you haven't seen it, it's a great thriller. It's really it's really gruesome and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think would appeal to you because I know you, you do a lot of true crime. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, seri- and serial killers, and some serial killers in there. Yeah, cults. I do all the good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, so if, so if, if you haven't read Headhunters and, or haven't seen the movie, I highly recommend it, both of yeah. them. You, you know, I was going to say, now you've got the uh, Nick Hoffman mystery series, the ninth book out now. Um how do you come together in writing a series like that? Because it's fictional, right? So you've created Nick Hoffman. Um, where do you get your characters from, and how do you put them together? I was talking to my editor at St. Martin's Press. He had published a book of short stories of mine, and I and uh, I'm the son of Holocaust survivor, so these stories were pretty serious. Uh, and... Um, he said, you know, you have a good sense of humor. You should write something funny. And I was thinking, like, what? And he said, well, you know, maybe like a screwball comedy or something like that. Well, I I love watching screwball comedies, but I didn't think I had that, that. At that time, I didn't think I had the timing to do it. I mean, there are a lot of things I didn't think I would be able to do back then that I've over time come to realize, oh, okay, now I know enough how to write X, Y, or Z. That's what's great about being a writer. You Hopefully you get better as you write more and you, and you read more and you're out in the world and you're talking to other writers. And, you know, they, I was casting around for an idea and I had a short story about uh, two guys who... Uh, who teach at a university, and the ex of one of them comes into their lives, and they have dinner, and it's kind of a mess. And someone said, uh, someone, I remember someone at a reading, I think, said to me, I don't like the way that story ended. The, the guest should have been killed, should have been poisoned at dinner. And I, you know, and sometimes people say really helpful things at readings or in reviews, and I thought, you know, that's a really good idea. I wish I had done that. And when my editors, uh, you know, chimed in, uh, you know, recommended a uh, mystery series, I thought, well, why don't I take those two characters? I already have the, the 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 academic setting, and let's see what I can do with that. You know, they're both from New York. They're they're not. They're really not like the typical Midwesterner in this town uh, that I've created, Michiganapolis, which is kind of an amalgam of East Lansing and uh, Lansing and other towns locally. So that so that's where the setting comes from. Somewhere in the series, I think in the fourth or fifth book, I bring in a, a, a professor of Canadian studies named Juno Dramgul, and she is foul mouth and she's kind of a combination of Tina Turner and Bette Midler. And she is the uh, the exact opposite of our cliché of Canadians. You know, she's not polite. She's not quiet. She's loud and boisterous and curses a lot and, and causes a lot of trouble in this English department. And I... Um, and I... She was suggested by... A number of different people I saw at a conference, actually three different women, and I said, oh, the way that woman dresses is really interesting. And then the way that woman talks is really interesting. And then uh, the way that woman interacts with people is really interesting. There were three different women, and I thought, hmm, they could t- I could take those traits, work with them, and, and create uh, one character. So a lot of the a lot of the characters are, are might start with something physical, you know, some physical trait, or be based on what somebody looks like, someone I've met, and then 
they just become uh, that is a magnet for other characteristics. So everybody is nobody is directly you know uh, nobody enters that series from real life. I mean, people have said to me, "Oh, I recognize so and so in in your third mystery," and I said, "Well, you're wrong. <laughs> That's not true because." He's not in there. I would know because I wrote <laughs> the book. No. Yeah, but no. I. So, so uh, well, Ian Rankin said that the 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 Scott uh, uh, crime writer. He said his father. I, I remember he, I was moderating a panel at I think BoucherCon and his uh, the Mystery Conference, and his uh, his father said, "You know that character is me." And he said, Dad, she's a nun. And he said, I know your tricks. That's me. You've disguised me. <laughs> well, you never know and what that, he's and, doing. <laughs> and, that, and that actually is something that I have done. Sometimes I have to, to use a real person as a character. If I really like their, who they are, I will change their gender. Mm. And that gives me freedom to work with them, and um, and I but I learned that in writing uh, short stories too, you know, is to take experiences and shift them, and and I got in a conversation once with someone who said, you know, I read a really good friend, I read that story, and I remember that incident, you know, uh, and I said, no you're remembering it wrong. She said, no, 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 I remember it happening exactly like that. I said, no, it happened in the winter, and I switched it to the summer. She said, no, I'm sure it happened in the summer. I said, no, I moved it <laughs> so that I could have freedom to play around with it. You know, I wouldn't feel bound by the facts. Um, and that's why I tell my students in creative writing, and I, I also uh, uh, teach online at writewithoutborders.com, and, you know, I tell people to feel free to switch things around, but um, in fiction, and um, well, it, it changes the perspective as well. Like if you change a character Absolutely. from a male to a female, um, it's going to change perspective because you're you're all now you're looking at it from a different. Person. Absolutely, and that person has a, a whole different view of the world and is viewed differently by the world and and walks through the world in a different way, literally and metaphorically. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, so that's so that's so my characters just come from all over, and sometimes I'll see somebody in you know in a hotel or a restaurant or on a bus or a train or whatever, and I think, hmm, and I'll just be really taken by something about them, by their manner or maybe the way they're speaking on the phone or whatever, and I'll just make some notes and you know. Usually they'll be end up being so cryptic that I'll find them days later, and I, I'm not sure quite what they mean. But uh, if I get to the if I get to uh, my, uh, my iPad or uh, my PC quickly enough, then I will um, then I'll jot it down and I'll I'll save it for something uh, for some book somewhere. Mm. Or it's just got me thinking. You know, that's why I tell student writers is that nothing you write is ever wasted. You know, because it's always teaching you something. Yeah, yeah, you learn as you go, always. Absolutely. Um, and, and now, with this, with this um, fiction series, with the Nick Hoffman series, um, do, what do you want people to get out of it when they read? So, w if I was to pick up a couple of them and I'm reading them, do you have some sort of meaning or underlying thought that you want people to walk away with? Not really. They are written as satires of the academic world, which is kind of pretty goofy to begin with. Um, so, uh, you know, it's it's a very it, it's a world with lots of high flown rhetoric about a community of knowledge and serving students and reaching out to uh, to the surrounding population in the town or whatever and. And you know we support diversity and equality and et cetera, et cetera. And you know a lot of times there, uh, what's underneath the surface is pretty pretty vicious. Um, Borges called it bold men arguing over a comb. And so um, 
no offense to anyone out there, including Jason Statham, if he's listening, because he looks really good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were talking about him before the show, and um, so you know, uh, so it's it's a satire. So I hope people enjoy entering a world that is very cl- uh, that's a closed world that is really goofy and uh, has its own very strange rules and ways of behavior, and. Um, you know, it's kind of like taking a safari uh, without having to go very far. Um, so that's they written. That's part of why they're written, and they also, you know, they're written as mysteries. And I hope mystery uh, crime fiction fans will enjoy uh, following the mystery. Uh, you know, discovering the corpse along with uh, with Nick Hoffman and finding out who did it and why. Uh, all, all those things appeal to me. I read my first mysteries probably it was probably Agatha Christie in junior high, and I fell in love with the form. I just loved the idea of things getting resolved at the end. Um, although I've had I've written some mysteries, some of the books in the series were a little open ended, uh, but and and not every mystery does resolve a hundred percent at the end. But uh, I just fell in love with Agatha, Agatha Christie and just started reading her and anyone else I could find uh, in the genre. And so, um, so I hope people will enjoy the books as satires of academia, but also as mysteries. As far as underlying thoughts, there's some social criticism in the book, uh, and and you know, and and cultural commentary. But that's not really the the main. That, that's not really the main thrust of what I'm doing in the books. I hope people will have fun. I had fun writing them, uh, and I hope people have fun reading them. That's really my main goal, is that to be entertaining. Yeah, but you don't always put an ha- a happy ending in there. Uh, well, you know, what does Oscar Wilde say? The good end happily and the bad unhappily. That is what fiction means, you know, Sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. I, the, you, you, you find out who the murderer is. I mean, that's important. In one book, the murderer gets away uh, for a very specific reason. Mm-hmm. So I won't say which one it is. I was playing around with form, and I thought, oh, this would be really interesting. Uh, to, to how did how did readers react to that, or what were, were you pleased with how it turned out? I was pleased with how it turned out. I didn't get any adverse criticism about about it at all. You know, I've been lucky. I've had really good reviews uh, with the series. The series is actually what made one of my dreams come true. It, it got me reviewed in the New York Times, and that's you know that was an an amazing experience. Um, my second book in the series, The Edith Wharton Murders, about uh, a, a liter- which is a uh, Nick Hoffman has to. Uh, corral two rival uh, literary societies into one conference, and they hate each other for complex reasons. But uh, and of course, somebody gets killed and, in the in the middle of it. And I got a rave review in the New York Times, a book review, and that that really launched the series. You know, I was and I was glad it was the second book because it's better than the first. In the first one, I was feeling my way in the form, but in the second one, I really felt like I knew what I was doing. He said, I mean, you know, there'll, there'll always be someone who say, well, I think you got X, Y, or Z. Do you go back then and, and reread your books or look back at them and never. go, oh, no, never. just walk away? Walk never. Away. I've never, I only read, re, well, I don't reread anything. I do readings from books, depending on what people would like me to do. So, like, my 19th book is a memoir called My Germany, uh, and it's about the role that Germany has played in my life and my family's life, uh, both the real Germany and the Germany I imagined. And I did about 50 or 60 readings from that book in the U.S., Canada, and across Germany. And so I read parts of that book many times. I've never read the book from the beginning to the end once I was done with it. Um, I, I didn't have to. I felt like I had lived the book, um, but I, the, the sections that I read that worked really well at readings, I knew those by heart practically, uh, which was very cool because I could ad-lib. That's a funny thing. You know, 
a reading. You know, I, I had some experience as in, as a theater, uh, theater major, uh, double major in theater and English for a while in college. So, um, so I was really comfortable being, you know, on stage in the, doing readings, uh, and I, I would improvise. You know, because what the text as it's on the page doesn't always work smoothly when you're reading it aloud. You know, and and more than just having to. Uh, add a he said or a she said so it's clear who's speaking. Sometimes a sentence might be a little long and it would work better if you split it in two for whatever reason. But uh, occasionally I'd be re- doing a reading and there'd be someone who'd come up after me uh, afterwards and say to me, well, you know, I was looking at the book while you were reading and you changed things. <laughs> <laughs> that made me laugh because I thought, well, I'm the writer. I don't I get to change things if I want to. <laughs> so I've changed them in, you know, in that sense and gone back and changed them in the moment. But I haven't gone back and re- rewritten anything. Um, I'm trying to think. Have I? I don't know. I don't think so. See, that's the other thing. After 26 books, someone will, will mention something like in, an, in one of my stories. And it might have appeared in a magazine in 1980 six or seven or eight and for them it's fresh because they've just read it i don't remember what's in it i mean honestly i'd have to look at it uh even even going over the um you know seeing a book through publication i if i haven't looked at it in a while i'll forget certain scenes which is which is good because then i can look at them with a fresh eye now you you uh, seem to have been affected a lot by the uh uh, the Holocaust and and th- that whole uh, series of of tragedies. And it, it, so, with the the world t- the way it is today, um, there's there's a lot of question into the Holocaust. How do you react to stuff like that? Oh, you mean people who deny the Holocaust? I, yeah, I've never met anyone personally who denies the Holocaust. I just think it. I I follow I. Uh, I like what Deborah Lipstadt, who was uh, who took a Holocaust denier to court in England and won. Right. Um, yeah. I it's it's as crazy as saying uh, African Americans were happy in slavery. That's what I say. That's I immediately compare it to the two. When people ask me about that, I say that's a lie. Uh, we know it's a lie. We have plenty of evidence that it's a lie. African Americans were not happy as slaves. They were brutally mistreated uh, in horrific ways, and we have the the evidence. And it's just, and we have the evidence that the Holocaust happened. And and people who deny both of those realities have an agenda, which is pretty ugly. Yeah, it's pretty it's it's pretty um, pretty weird the way the world's going. Um, and Isn't it always? Uh, isn't it always yeah. so? I mean, someone probably, uh, you know, back in in Babylon, you know, uh, thirty five hundred years ago, said, "God, the world is really strange these days." You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, so many kids. locusts. I don't remember there being so many locusts. My grandfather said we didn't used to have this many locusts. You know, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Except then they would have said the gods are angry, right? I mean, they would have had an answer to it. The same now, right? Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't change much. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, it's kind of crazy. Um, and so now you've also. Uh, oh, I was going to say actually when we were talking about the world today. Um, so does this COVID nineteen and and the whole um, you know um, strange pandemic thing that's happened to us all? Does that sort of affect you in your writing? I am waiting to see. There's a wonderful line in a Tennessee Williams play. Um, it's a, an early version of Summer and Smoke, where the main character Alma is uh, someone is coming to see her gentleman caller, and she doesn't want to see him. And uh, her mother says, "What shall I tell him?" And she says, "Tell him I've changed, and I'm waiting to see in what way." It's a really simple line, but it's very powerful, and. I know that this experience of a worldwide pandemic is changing me. I know that being in quarantine, uh, even though uh, you know, even though I'm not suffering the way many people are, um, I know it's changing me. I don't know how yet. I haven't been. I haven't felt the urge to write about it. 
uh, in any way. Um, so I don't know. It, you know, the, the thing is, with all writers and everyone who's out there who's a writer knows that things, you know, things that happen to you are like dropping a stone in a well, and you hear the splash, and it's but it comes from a, a long distance in a way, you know, and it takes time. Now there are people who respond instantly, you know, to to whatever experience, a hurricane or a war, and uh, but. I don't. I'm not like that, and I know a lot. Uh, a lot of my writer friends aren't like that either. They're just kind of waiting to see what their imagination will offer up. That's that's where I'm at. But I also have a novel that yeah, is 200 pages long that I am waiting to get my mojo back for. So once things settle down one way or another with the pandemic, I think I'll be able to go back to that novel. Now, it's possible that COVID-19 will change what what happens in that book. I don't know. It's very it, I could I could set it in the middle of the pandemic. I don't know. I might I might move it up in time. I always just think when there's a lot of um, kind of darkness or sort of negativity going on, like every day you turn on the TV or if you hear about it, there's, you know, the protests and then you've got the pandemic and all that. If it makes you feel uh, darker and would would that come out in your writing? Would you write it from more of a, a, a dark or negative angle? I don't think so. I think, um, you know, well, you know, we've had a... We've had a pretty strange couple, uh, uh, three plus years since uh, Obama was president, and you know that's inspired me to write two comic mysteries. So I went in the other direction. I mean, the darkness made me write uh, satire. Huh. And so, and the satire of the administrators in. Uh, you know my most um, my recently published book, uh, State University of Murder. There, people will see some similarities with politicians there. So there are some subtle and maybe not so subtle uh, connections to the current political scene there. Undercurrents, call them what you will. References, um, nothing, nothing really overt, but it, you know, that's. That was my response. My response to darkness is to write something lighter um, right now. I, I don't know what I will be writing a year or two from now. I never thought I'd write a historical novel. I did, Rosedale and Love, set in you know the Gilded Age. I honestly never thought I'd write a mystery series until the idea came to me out of talking to my, uh, uh, my editor. You know, I... Didn't there are a lot of things I never thought I'd be writing. Uh, one of the books is actually re- uh, um, Assault with a Deadly Lie in the series is actually written more as a novel of suspense. I never thought I would be able to do that. I never thought I'd have the timing right for a novel of suspense, uh, and that starts with a, a real bang, and you know, and, and was a nominee for a Midwest uh, Book Award. And so I was really pleased that it got that kind of recognition. And, you know, so I don't know what I'll be writing next. I mean, I can't can't predict. I I do know I I won't be writing the same thing as I've written just before. Uh, That I I can promise you because I'd be bored. I get bored really easily. (laughs) And the Vampire of Gotham, how did that come about? Well, it's kind of a spin-off of uh, Rosedale and Love. Um, Edith Wharton's a writer that I really loved uh, and really influenced me early on, partly because I grew up in New York and so did she, and, and you know, there were a lot of ways that I knew pieces of her, uh, the New York that she knew. Uh, and so I wrote uh, The House of Mirth is probably her most famous book, uh, and the bestseller in 1905, and in, uh, one of the characters in, in there is Jewish, and she has a fairly negative portrayal of him, which is typical of that period in her class. So um, I was inspired by uh, uh, books like White Sargasso Sea, 
uh, by Gene Reese that um, plays with uh, Wuthering Heights. No, it's not Wuthering Heights. It's one of the other Bronte novels. Uh, and Jane Eyre, sorry, and uh, looks at the life of the of the of the wife who is locked up in the in the attic, and I just kind of or Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are are dead, which you know takes two minor characters and makes them the center of a play in which Hamlet is a minor character. So I re I just wrote a novel uh, where. Uh, Lily Barth, the heroine of the book, is a secondary character, and the Jewish character and his family are the main characters, and that was a lot of fun to do. And then I just kind of did my own spin-off. I thought, hmm, what if he was a vampire, and wouldn't that be interesting? So I just did did a novella, and I made it really erotic. Uh, uh, it starts with him in a bordello with a French prostitute. So... Um, and that, so, and that's another thing I never thought I'd write. I never thought I'd write erotica. <laughs> you know, so so that was a twofer. I got to, you know, I got to uh, boldly go where I where Lev Raphael had never gone before. I wrote I wrote horror and I wrote uh, erotica and I loved it. You know, and I'm I'm kind of working on a sequel. So that was. So again, I you know people say, well, would you write a romance? I said, well, I don't know. Maybe if if I had the right story and if I had the right characters, maybe I would. I don't think I'd write a western. I I enjoy watching them. I don't know if that that's a genre that I know well enough to to write. I have read I have read romances. I haven't read enough westerns. So, uh, but you know, I, who can say? You know, that that's a great thing about a, a writing career. Um, that's a great thing, and that's the, and that's the downfall or the downside. It's it's totally unexpected. You never know what's going to happen. I mean, and that could be good or that can be bad. I remember one Thanksgiving, uh, the day before Thanksgiving, an editor called and said she was dropping a handful of books, and mine was one of them. And I, <laughs> right before Thanksgiving, is that great? I said, Why did you call me now? And she said, Well, I didn't want to hold on to this through the holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad you're going to have a Merry Christmas, too. You know, wonderful. And so I was really not into turkey and mashed potatoes that year. Uh, and But then, you know, um, I was recently invited to, because of all my work, was recently invited to teach in Germany for four months. I mean, so, uh, and that came out of the blue. So a writing career is really crazy, uh, I, and and that's also something I tell student writers at whatever stage of student uh, of their lives they're in, that if you really go into this and 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 make this your life, make it a career, it is it is a roller coaster ride. Hey, Lev, what, that's, we, we've asked this for, of a number of other writers as well that have come on. I mean, what uh, what other advice would you give someone just getting started? in 2020 when publishing looks really different than it used to or or about the craft what do you tell your students um, like when they're just getting started in the program that you teach in well I would tell them if you find a reader you admire read everything she has written every damn word everything I read it more than once study both for reading for pleasure but also study what the, what that writer does that you admire and and not to copy it but to learn from it and as a model uh, going forward I would also uh, I also tell uh, student writers um, read variously read in different genres you know I don't read in as many genres as I used to but I mean I look around my library you know I have a, a section of biography and a section of psychology and a section of history and you know, a section of American literature and a section of literature and translation and a section on the Holocaust and a section of Judaica and a section on you know um, uh, uh, Christianity because I was thinking uh, early Christianity because I was thinking of doing a novel in the time of Jesus which I still haven't figured out but you know we'll see if that ever if that ever flies so you know read widely uh read wisely um and uh, you know find 
the people who you think can give you the best advice. Like if you're in a pro writing program or in a college, um, if you can find a mentor, that's great. If you're in a writing group, be really careful because sometimes those can be not supportive. Um, if you if you are serious about writing, uh, you know a writing program is not a bad idea because it's like becoming an uh, entering a monastery in a way. Uh, you de dedicate yourself really intensely to your craft. Uh, I think that's one way to learn your craft. Um, I think f for some people, uh, I would say if you can find uh, – some people are really good at this, at finding a niche where they can become really big on Instagram or TikTok or any of the other platforms. Um, that is often a way to get a publishing contract now. So there are lots of different ways to uh, both to get into the pub into publishing, but and there are many ways to educate yourself. I think well, a, a good writer's that I've met are all widely read. I think that's really important is to read, read, read um, because that's how you learn uh, what good writing is and that's how you learn all the different pieces of writing. You know, how to construct a story, how to build characters, how, how to create a scene, how to move people around in a scene, how to do good dialogue. And mm -hmm. it, you can't just create it out of your own head or just from watching television. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do watch a lot, I confess I do watch a lot of television, and you know I am, um, especially crime series. Uh, I I'm really fascinated in in, uh, in seeing how other people do you know do their mysteries and uh, create their characters, and it also teaches me what cliches to avoid. Um, you know, one of the big cliches that I've been noticing for a while now is whatever the sleuth is, he or she has a screwed up teenage kid. Oh. <laughs> I see this everywhere. I see this in books. I see this on TV. I see this in movies. And once one of my editors said, you know, what if your what if your uh, what if your main character adopts, or what if he discovers he actually has a kid, and a teenage kid shows up at his door? And I said, no friggin' way! <laughs> <laughs> I am not going down that route. I I've seen other people do it way too often. I'm not going to do that. That's as bad as all those movies that end with the line, "Let's go home." <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they, I, if you, do you think those kind of writers are just because they're they're writing such mass amounts of writing, like for television and stuff, and uh, and Netflix nowadays, that maybe they're just uh, grabbing formulas, you know, just putting it. Together. Oh, absolutely. Especially, and I would say, especially any any show where they're constantly dropping the f bomb. I have nothing, absolutely nothing against obscenity in in dialogue but if i hear the f-bomb drop every other word by every other character i think well that's really lazy writing because you don't have to write that many words <laughs> you just you know and i and i actually uh i i kind of said this to one mystery writer when i was uh, the crime fiction reviewer at the detroit free press i said you know you well, we were at the bar, and you know, and uh, with a bunch of other writers. And I said, you know, your your second book, you uh, use the you know, use a lot of obscenity that you didn't use in the first one. And he said, yeah, no one else noticed it but you. <laughs> but he was sorry that he had done it. He said it wasn't as strong as his first book, and he knew it. And I think it was sophomore jitters, you know. Um, and he was probably cursing as he was writing. He was, he was probably thinking, F this and F that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a lot of pressure writing, you know, and that's, uh, and hopefully, uh, the other thing I tell writers, and I think the main thing I tell writers is, don't, don't buy into you must write this way. Like, you, or you, or even you must write every day. I think that's really damaging to people who can't write every day or don't feel like writing every day. Uh, or, you know, I, I tell people, see if you can discover how and when you write the best. What is your method? What really works for you? Uh, 
that's really hard. That's really hard to find that. You know, a lot of people say, uh, use the cliche, you know, uh, writers have to find their voice. Before they even find their voice, I think they have to find their method. They have to find um, how, how to write, how, what the best conditions are for them in which to write, and how to create their own world um, bef- before they even know what their voice is. That, that comes later. I said that. You see, they, it, uh, Greg and Julie were laughing at me before. Yes. I go yeah. away. I, I can't write at home. Uh, like I can get a lot of evidence together right. and do a lot of work, but I need to go somewhere else because uh, it just doesn't work at home, and I know that. So um, I always leave, I, and I love going to cities that I haven't been to before. I love being in a hotel in a city downtown uh, where there's a lot of people, and it gives me a certain kind of feeling or atmosphere that comes with that, that puts me in the mood to do what I need to do. That's terrific. That's great. I might create a. I might use a character and give that to a character. I like the idea. Of that. Mm-hmm. There's a certain feel uh, isolation you get uh-huh. when you're surrounded by a million people that you do not know, and they're going about their life as if it's normal, and because you're not really noticed. So when you're in amongst that group, you kind of almost see a whole little little world going on, and that always puts me in the mood to be able to finish, the, like put out the storyline that goes with the book, because the book is... It's all true and it's all the stuff, the evidence. But you have to construct. You have to put a voice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have to put it together. And hotels are wonderful for concentration. I can do reviews in hotels. I can do a review or a blog in a hotel. I can write something short, uh, and I and I often take notes when I'm on the road. Um, I don't work uh, work long scenes. Partly, uh, or, or really work intensely on the book, partly just to give myself a break. I mean, if I'm on a book tour, that, you know, I, that's a lot of work, uh, as it is. Uh, but I can do, I can work on short pieces when I'm on the road. And I, and I, I get what you're saying because I really like that sense of, I am so far away from my normal world and everything in it. And the play, you know, no matter how nice the hotel room is, it's stripped of everything that you, that's yours, <laughs> unless you bring all your crap with you in a separate. Thing. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, no, no, leave, leave it all home except for my little computer and um, all that stuff. But no, everything stays home. I'd love it. Yeah. That's great. That's a great image. Well, well there you go, uh, and and make your character a woman. <laughs> Uh, a nun. A nun. A Canadian nun. A Canadian nun. A Canadian nun. nun. Canadian nun. Hmm. There you go. Yeah, that'll be, some, that'll be that. some very interesting research. I, will, <laughs> I, actually, know, I actually know some, some priests, and I've met a nun. I, I can start doing research right now. Oh, well, there you go. You see? You need an idea, come to me. Absolutely. <laughs> 1-800-IDEAS, is that it? Yeah, one eight hundred. Yeah, I've got I've got apps for everything. So, um, well, hey, listen, I, I, we're running out of time. Uh, I want to make sure you give out your website. So, um, the website and anywhere you want people to contact you. Well, my website is levrafael dot com, and there's a contact page, and you can contact me via that and ask me anything about my books or about writing. I'm happy to chat. And if you and I uh, teach individualized workshops and mentor at writewithoutborders.com and there's a whole range of things that I do there and I also edit manuscripts so uh, of all kinds so I work across genres so uh, that is, or you can find me on Facebook or Twitter uh, those are the only two platforms I do I had to uh, I had to ration social media because it 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 could take over your life yeah oh yeah no I agree totally you know, uh, Twitter, uh, even Twitter, I'm kind of uh, weak on myself. Uh, you know, grinders more. <laughs> <laughs> and and grinder has a has a much more appealing name than Twitter. I mean, honestly, yeah. better pick. Uh, right, and wouldn't you rather grind <laughs> than tweet? I mean, honestly, <laughs> I think we all would. Well, yeah, it works. It works for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.
It's been a lot of fun. You guys have a great day. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.